All righty. So today, as we continue down the path of people, we thought it would be good, having sp spent so much time on the gap analyzer last week, um, we thought, you know, as you go through the gap analyzer, as you talk about um, where your people are using their time, um, how they're using their time, where their hours are going, what it shifts to a lot of times is, is that the best use of time? And is that the best use of time in their position? But if you don't have an org chart, sometimes positions become kind of um, vague, like, okay, so where does this position plug in? And if I am going to delegate and elevate, if I am going to change some things around in the organization, we'll talk about that a little more next week, but it helps to know, well, where am I elevating to and what am I delegating down? How does this supposed to work? And so the first step we find with working with people is after we pull them through a gap analyzer, we would always suggest helping them out with an org chart. So I have pulled up an org chart. Um, this is an uh, older iteration of Pedro Deo's organization at 100X. They've grown since then. This is something we helped them out with initially, but I thought we could take a look at theirs because I feel like it, it examples well what you want to be thinking through from an organization. So I know it's very, very small right now. I wanted to give it to you in this view first, and then I'll zoom in. Um, but the reason I want to show you this view is because I'm going to just talk about coloring. You can use whatever kind of coloring you want. You can um, signify however you want it to look. But essentially, any that are in this color are Pedro's current team or team that they were hiring towards um, and had them kind of in pocket already. Any in this darker color of orange is actually collab team where we were fitting into the team in just a temporary holding position. I think we've talked about that in, in the past where collab team really helps teams is as they're experiencing this upshoot of growth, we can come in alongside of them, take them through a gap analyzer, kind of assess where they're where they're at with their people and their processes and then make suggestion on, hey, why don't you let us help you bear some of the load if you're experiencing a lot of growth. It's nice just to have experts that can come in and just you can flex into their bandwidth. And so um, these were some of the positions we held and, and some of them are multiple players. And then obviously, you know, at height, we were at eight players inside of Peter's organization. And, you know, and then we scale out, you know, we help create the standard uh, uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures, and we create kind of a role. And then we begin to exit and help them begin to hire in people internally. So that's kind of the big picture. We're going to zoom in and see some things about an org chart that I think are really important. And then we're going to look at job descriptions that set up against some of these positions. So you can see what we would recommend when it comes to not only how things are framed up, but how roles and responsibilities should work within different positions within the organization. Ben, does that sound good to you? I mean, I guess. I guess. Awesome. Taryn, mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any thoughts that you want to add to that? Um, I think one other time I've seen different colors being used was as they were building out the organization, they were noting which ones were actual employees and which ones were contractors. Good. So they knew which positions they wanted to eventually transfer out. Okay. So not just collab team, but other contractors they might have had that's that they might want to eventually turn into employees. That's smart. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good way to do it, especially because as you grow, you're probably going to want to get away from so many contractors. You're probably going to want to grow internal team because I mean, brass tax is just cheaper to have people that work for you internally than it is to hire out. Contractors have to charge a certain rate because they're not working for you full time and they have multiple clients they work for. But when you bring them in house, a lot of times you can kind of drop your overhead a little bit. And the nice thing about bringing people in house is they're always working on your stuff. You know, some of the downside can be with working with contractors is if you're in a pinch, they might be in a pinch with other clients too. They can't just be readily available when they're your people. You have a little bit more control over how available they are. And that probably calls out a good thing. This this third color, this blue color is actually um, new hires. So that was things that predictively we were saying needed to be coming soon, um, but weren't quite online yet. So good one. Let's look at it a little closer, shall we? Might be a little bit close. Okay, so obviously you're always starting with CEO on the top. Um, most CEOs that we find at the top are visionaries. You know, the guys that have all the vision, they see where everything needs to go. But when it comes to the minutia, they kind of suck at it. Like they're not super good. They don't want to get in the weeds. It actually drains them of their energy. They, they, I, I would watch early on when we first started engaging with Pedro and he was trying to be really good to us. Um, he would show up at, at the L10 meetings and he would try and sit through the whole L10 meeting. And I would just watch like the energy drain. out. Of <laughs> and I felt like you could just watch him just more and more, just like, why am I here? And so I found um, at the CEO level with visionaries, they're there and they're great to come and they're great to give a word. They're great to like give direction from the top. But then honestly, from an operations perspective, 
I kind of would rather them bounce out and let me just kind of run things from that place or have them come on at the end for me to ask a bunch of questions to after I triage all the pain points with the team. Because otherwise what you can have, depending on the size of your team, as you start doing L10 meetings or, or whatever kind of meeting that you do organizationally, we, we prefer L10, which is the EOS model, Entrepreneur's Operating System from Gino Wickman's book, Traction. But the reason why we advocate for L10 is because it's a very, very simple process that you go through and you work through issues. But if you start taking a visionary through all the issues, like either they're going to get hung up on something that you don't want them hung up on. They're going to create pain points that aren't true pain points, that it's just something that they were frustrated with. And you can get lost in the weeds so easy. Or maybe like some of your like lower team members are starting to ask questions that really aren't pertinent. That's not what you really need from them. So what I found is if you can shake down all of like, these are the five core things we really need Pedro's input on, and then bring him in at the end and be like, just rapid fire him those five questions. It keeps him very focused. It is a, a short amount of time. So he doesn't have to, you don't have to watch the life drain out of him um, or, or her. If they're, if you have a lady that's leading from the top and it keeps them in their zone, the whole, the whole gift of gap analyzer and even an org chart is how can we keep people in their brilliance? Pedro's brilliance is not in the minutia. CEOs typically their brilliance is not in the minutia. That's why they hire people like you and me to help them work through all the details. So Pedro at the top is a visionary. Typically an EA is pretty typical to the role. Holly is Pedro's. And um, I was in a temporary seat of integrator. Integrator is a term from the EOS model. It, you can think as you see that they're director of operations, COO, whatever the title is. And then from underneath there, we had the different silos of the business. So for Pedro's, it was CE, which is customer experience. And then they had some product delivery, um, which was for him, crush it with challenges and coaching. And then they had marketing and sales. And as you slide over this way, Pedro actually had a whole different silo of a business that happened underneath Rami, which is their Fortress financial business. So it, it wasn't necessarily part of the core of what Pedro would consider 828 media or you know, Crush It With Challenges, 100X was with Pedro's primaries. Um, Rami kind of had his own silo, but it was still connected enough to the company that we wanted to show it here because there might be some crossover um, between team and we wanted to at least be able to represent it there. Um, as we look at it, you know, and, and these are just um, examples, this, you know, things have changed in Pedro's organization. So this is a little bit old. Um, but what I the reason I wanted to show it to you for this was to show you, we believe in every position, there should be three to five key duties, like every position should have three to five things to do. That's not the only things they're going to be doing. But it is going to be some of the things they're doing. Ben, did you drop something? Look at that. You're so good. Do we have a Slido? Ben, do I, did I give you a Slido for this one? You have not given me a Slido. Man, I dropped the ball on that one. Okay, guys, hold your questions and I'll make sure. Actually, I think the email has the Slido, right? Can somebody grab it off of the reminder real quick, turn it, Ben? Yep. Drop it into the chat. Slido is just our questions collector so that you can be asking questions throughout the presentation and we can make sure we address them at the end. So anyway, back to the presentation, back to our discussion. Um, each position we believe should have three to five key duties. Um, that's not the only, look at that. There's your Slido connect if you want to grab it. I'm going to grab it and hope it's not going to bounce. It did. Should have known better, Taryn. It's just so I can grab it later. Um, we believe every position should have three to five. That's not the only thing that they're going to be doing, but it is a lot of what they're going to be doing is wrapped up in these three to five things. So for this new hire, we were looking for a community manager at the time. The three to five key duties would be policy decisions for customer experience, retention and refunds, and then community management. So those, those are three pretty, pretty beefy duties, um, especially for Pedro. They were just building out a lot of their policies you know, and how they were going to handle things. So that, that took a lot of time. They were, we were just fleshing out in this season of Pedro's organization, Zendesk. And so a lot of the things that became macros or you know, policy answers on things had to be created. And we needed somebody that was really focusing time on that. Um, retentions and refunds, that's a really key duty. But we found that within customer experience, it was hard for some of the, the people that weren't always in all of the details to be able to handle some of the difficult conversations around people wanting refund and then you having to hold them to the fire on, well, this is the policy around refunds and then trying to woo them back into the boat so that they weren't just ejecting because they were having buyer's remorse. It took some time and, and that was a big part of the role. And it's you don't want to just be hemorrhaging sales. 
You don't want Pedro to go out and capture all these sales and then just lose a bunch of them out, out the boat because nobody's working on retention. So that was part of this person's role. And then community management. Obviously, with Pedro, every challenge that they did, they were doing a community built around that, you know, so they would have these community groups, you know, these Facebook groups that needed to be monitored, needed to be had people underneath them, but somebody at the top needed to kind of be main braining it and making sure it was dialed in. So that was the three primary roles of this community manager, CE manager. And then it rattled down, you know, so a CE level two, CE level one. And then, you know, we had a couple different CE level ones. For CE level two, it was extension of the manager, efficiencies for macros and FAQs, and then L1 duties, uh, CRM crossover. So there was just some different things that needed to be handled within um, Infusionsoft um, and a level one training duties for the people underneath them. So what we believe in is a hierarchy. You know, so these people down here are the soldiers that are marching, but they're not going to always have all of the answers for chat, email, and phones, and they need to have somebody they can rattle it up to. So these folks would rattle it up to Brent. Brent would try and take a punch at it first. Things he couldn't get answers on, he would rattle it up to the CE manager and so on. So that we're keeping the people at the top out of the day-to-day -day is the goal. Same thing as we, for, for production development and fulfillment manager, the three Three primaries for him were create alongside the CEO, fleshing out the details of the vision, think through end-to-end -end delivery and products, and product crossover, customer journey, and ownership of all bonus fulfillment. That is where things can get hairy. You know, you've got a guy from the top that's selling strong, and a lot of times in the moment is throwing out the kitchen sink. You know, I mean, like everything. They, you know, they're trying to win sales, and so they're offering, 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 offering. But if somebody's not tracking how things are supposed to be fulfilled, and how much did we offer last time, and how much crossover is there, and what's being delivered in the membership area, and all the different pieces that come with that, and then helping them really flesh out some of the things that were being developed and being sold, Scott was fulfilling that, especially in Crush It with Challenges, and had an admin underneath him, and then Josh is the coaching manager with a coaching admin. And like I said, this wasn't completely a fleshed out, but it was just kind of an example to show you this morning and so on. With marketing, there were a lot of things that are held underneath the marketing. In my, in my opinion, this is one of the hardest jobs in the organization um, because you have so many vendors that you're working with um, and you're monitoring your JV relationships and some of your affiliate programs. This is a big catch-all. So it's a real key hire. And then for them, sales manager as well, you know, of, how are we selling? Once we leave a challenge environment, how are sales being nurtured? What's the sales plan we're operating to? Um, these two work hand in hand. They call it um, a SAM plan, sales marketing plan. So the marketing is generating, hey, what kind of events are we going to use to generate sales? They work with the sales manager on, okay, what kind of sales do you think that we could predictively expect? And then these two are holding each other accountable of if they come out on the other side of that event and it hasn't generated the right amount of sales, how does the marketing plan need to be adjusted so that we don't miss the target of what we're shooting for at the end of the year on hoping to grow sales to by the end of this year or uh, contingent years moving forward. And then obviously the sales manager is the one that's motivating the salespeople underneath them and the sales assistant. Taryn, anything that you wanna to add to that, Ben, anything you wanna to add to org chart review? I think, um, as you can see here, <clears throat> the, you know, your basic four areas underneath uh, the integrator, the operations, you know, pretty important functions is community ex customer experience, uh -huh. um, marketing, sales, and operations. And, and those are the four key areas we tend to break businesses out into. And then you can extend them from there. Some people put product development under customer experience. Um, in this situation, it was its own breakout because we had a pretty developed product developed coordinator for Pedro's team. So he had his own breakout, but people might bundle that into community customer experience. But those are, those are gonna be your big four areas uh, that you see us talk about a lot too, just sales, marketing, operations, customer experience. That's a good, good point. And obviously that's what you saw in the gap as well. Like that's the, that's why the gap analyzer is framed it as it is. And you might need to modify that a little bit. You may need to call things. You know, we were, I was on a call yesterday um, with a new client that's going through the gap. And one of the questions that came back was, well, hey, so with sales, we do a lot of like, Ben, it reminded me of doing coffee. Um, he's like, there's a lot of drama that comes up with salespeople. Like we've got it, we've got 40 salespeople. Like a lot of it is we just end up emotionally working people through pain points they're feeling on their sales calls. Um, where do we stick that? Should that be sales necessarily? And I said, well, 
I would say start it as sales, but then maybe in the notes section, drop in the notes section, operational meeting. And then we can have some discussion in the follow-up calls of, should that be shifted to operations? Should that still be considered sales? But we feel like those, those four are the primary. And then you can kind of subtask down underneath that mm -hmm. um, as, you're, as you're going through the gap. Ben, any, any thoughts on your end? No, I like it. It's perfect. I would, I mean, just to ramp off Taryn, yeah, those are the four pillars. And depending on your business, you know, those are going to be tweaked, you know, if you're an online business or brick and mortar business, but even in the differences between online and brick and mortar, they both share that common theme of those four main pillars of, of, of your business. So um, yeah, it's great. I would say the other thing I wanted to point out was um, Savannah C gets sort of overlapped into sales a lot too, which is important to notice in the Gap app. Yes, that is true. That is true. And, and even I think as you develop out how your CE, your customer experience department works, I think realizing there probably should be some sort of sales function, like a first pass at least, and then like to triage through, is this somebody that deserves sales team attention? You know, like there's, there's probably soft sales or in-house sales, maybe they call them, you know, and it's like, can, can they be converting? And I know in some organizations we've worked with, they've actually put metrics around that. We expect this, the customer experience department to be generating this much in sales each month, each year. You know, and it's just like a baseline. It's not something radical, but gives them something to target towards and even maybe some bonus structure around that for your CE folks who may feel like I'm not much of a salesman, but it's like nobody knows the products like you. So mm -hmm. you kind of are. And especially if people are calling in and they're thinking about exiting, you can be like, hey, before you think about that, have you considered this crossover? And sometimes it can just be a swap in sale. It can be a swap in product. It can be, or maybe downgrading people into something different. There is a level of sales that's part of CE. And so that's a really good point, Savannah. Um, I think also something I wanted to point out was as you think about L10 meetings, and I know um, Kimberly, you and I have been having some conversation around L10 meetings. Um, L10 meetings are level 10 meetings, and usually they're categorized by a grouping. So you, you may see some invites that go out from us may say LT, L10 meeting, leadership team, um, L10 meeting. That would be, from our perspective, all these people here at the, at the top row. You know what I mean? So we're talking about you know, your visionary. A lot of times his EA will be part of that leadership team just for the sake of keeping this dude on, on point or keeping this lady on point. Um, the integrator, and then your core management like the core leaders of your organization, that should be your leadership team. And the reason you would get them together for a weekly or a bi-weekly meeting is so that all of you can bring into one central spot issues and pain points you're working through so that you can all hear the same answers. Otherwise it turns into a terrible game of telephone. Like who, who oh, wait a minute, did they hear that? Who, did he, who didn't hear that? And then it just becomes super hard and confusing on how is information being disseminated throughout the organization? If you have one central meeting where everybody's hearing the same thing, and then as you come out of that meeting, you remind people, hey, make sure you cascade this down. Make sure you send this out to your team. Make sure you think through how there might be implications of tech changing this and what CE needs to know about tech changing that because there could be big waves kicked up downstream for the customer experience department by a small shift in tech and just that need for everybody to be hearing the same things. That's why we would advocate for a weekly or a bi-weekly L10 meeting because it keeps your chatter down, right? It keeps Slack from getting noisy. It keeps email inboxes from piling up. It keeps texts at a minimum because if everybody can think to themselves, oh, wait, we have an L10 on Wednesday. I'll just drop it into the issues list. Then it becomes a collector there of issues that need to be triaged. Obviously, there's still same day pain points that need to be rattled up. You know, you need a, a, a direct message or an instant message answer on. But let's try and keep instant messages down. Like, right? Nobody wants to be in the middle of working on a project and getting pinged, 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 pinged by ancillary issues that could be addressed on a weekly meeting. They don't need that answer today, you know? And then I would say, even advocate for them, we're going to talk about later in Ops Experts, not only alongside of your instant message, but also having some sort of project management tool that you can begin to have conversations around specific projects instead of just pinging everything into. Slack or into WhatsApp or whatever your collector is for your instant message. Like, let's have a product management tool that you can have product projects going and then be having conversations in those projects so that when you do come to an L10, you really have the details that you need and then you can go disseminate out in the right channels in the right spots. Any thoughts on that? Kimberly, do you have any thoughts on that? I know you've been working through L10s. Any questions? I want to make sure that I'm letting you speak. I, I really value you a lot. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely something that we need and we're not 
implementing right now. Um, so in the EOS training we did with Bobby, I just pulled some notes and made an ugly document and kind of like follow the structure of the L10 meeting because I loved it with my little teams. So I had like two little teams I was working on and we just, that was our structure. They love it. Um, but we do not have a meeting like for leadership. Yeah. Um, we have a weekly meeting that's like, um, visionary tech people marketing people and then everyone just comes in at a different time <laughs> yeah. yep. so I, I mean i get to meet with them like 45 minutes and it's it's usually not it's usually not structured um beforehand so sometimes I, like you said things that aren't really important become like important and then things that really should have been addressed kind of get swept under the rug again so this is definitely something that we need to do we also um need an org chart <laughs> um i've been working on one a smidge before i even actually had a dream about it so i got up and like mapped it out so these um these four different pillars you have here that would be really helpful to map those out so that we could even know like who who's coming to the l10 meeting yep. and who's responsible for what so we got a lot of work to do on the the people over where i'm at yeah um but i'm i'm loving this and i i think it's going to help us grow so much that's good i think one one thing i've uh, seen with org chart development too is you don't always need to build it based on who you have sometimes it's great to build it based on where you want to be yep and then start filling it in from there um where your players do fit and where they aren't fitting and who you still need to hire for uh, that's really good Tara. yeah i have two <laughs> i, I have the one that's like this is kind of where we're at and it's kind of messy and then i have like based from the book um rocket fuel like yep. this is kind of where we want to go so yeah awesome yeah rocket fuel is just another one of gino's books or one of the eos books that couples up against traction so it's a great great compliment and i think too that's a really good point taryn is i think all of us especially those of us who wired are wired for operations we kind of want it perfect now I mean, like, we're like, wait, well, I just saw this. This is where we should be. And then we put all this pressure on ourselves instead of realizing, no, no, it's okay. Anything that you organize right now is going to be better than when you started with no organization. So start it easy. Like, and I think that Kimberly, I love what you're doing. You can control these groups that are under you. And that's what I, I think that's a good point that you brought up is, yeah, an, L, an LTL10 is going to be a leadership team. But the goal with the L10 model is, is that each one of these guys would start, or gals, would start doing their own L10s for their own departments. And so Kimberly, that's all you're doing is you're, you're kind of a proof case, you know, so that you can bring back to your visionary and be able to say, hey, this is what I've been doing. It's been working really great. And your visionary actually did ask me for the org chart um, just yesterday. He's like, hey, could you send me over that org chart we were working on? So you're making more traction than you realize and you're doing great. So good job on that front. I would Thanks. say along the same note too is especially as us operational people like those perfect details is to not be afraid to let this evolve mm -hmm. because as you you know once you create your org chart and you have it set you'll probably notice about three to six months that people start naturally gravitating and you find some tendencies where this person's better at marketing but i have them in my CE team, and maybe we should evolve this org chart because it needs to shift what people are good at, what people are not good at. I think uh, oper us operations people love to get into the rut of like, no, it's perfect. I designed it myself. It's great. It's awesome. And then your visionary is like, but is it really? Because I really want that guy as a sales guy. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to let it evolve and change this over time as your organization just evolves over time too. Yeah, I think they. The, the way that EOS often addresses that is they talk about seats on the bus. Like let's let's design it for seats on the bus and not think about who's gonna be in those seats yet. Mm -hmm. because the What would be our ideal situation? And then let's take an inventory of who we have of players to fit. And then let's fit them because if they're if they're long lasting players and they're gonna fit well in the culture of our organization, we're know, we know we're gonna use them somewhere. Don't get too attached to they have to be what you've always known them to be because they may actually find that they enjoy a different place better and the organization might run smoother if you actually change the way that you're thinking about them. So that's good, Ben, good point. Let's look real quick. We had talked about three to five um, key duties. I thought looking at a job description would help like kind of flesh out some of that. This is an older iteration, um, Pedro Adeo job description. I thought it would be good just to stick to, we were looking at org chart. I thought we could look at one of the one of the positions. This is for the customer experience representative, which was down here, one of the level ones. 
but I thought just a good fleshing out of what it should, what should be contained in a job description. This isn't like the only way to do it. This, we helped uh, Pedro develop this one. And so this is obviously the way we advocate for going with it, but essentially calling out at the beginning, kind of what the position is you're hiring for, how many hours you expect it to be fulfilling. That's a good thing to start with. Um, kind of framing up how they fit in the team. This is where org chart is really key because they know who they're answering to right out of the gates um, and who they're working closely with. I think the Pedro Adeo organization has gotten really good lately about having people that kind of have a touching point on multiple parts of the business, but they still are, are kind of in one business setting. An example would be for this position is this customer experience representative is mostly dealing with 100x style pain points, but they are going to need some knowledge base and crush it with challenges. They probably are going to need some knowledge base in some of the other offerings that Pedro offers, but it's primary towards one. So that's what it's saying there. Um, gives kind of a call out of th this is the overall arcing part of this position. Guide, encourage, support, communicate, motivate, exude positivity to our customers and community. Um, you're the face of the brand, man. It's so sad to me. You, like any of us, we've all experienced it where we have a bad customer experience with probably the lowest man on the totem pole, but then it, it shapes our whole perspective on the brand. Amazon sucks. You know what I mean? But it's like, really, is that Jeff Bezos's problem? Or was that like the problem was at their lowest level, they should have really made sure that people have the right tools, are the right fit, you know, are being supported well. Um, here's the position summary. Um, just kind of lines out in words what we're looking at or looking for from a customer experience representative. Keywords that jump out there is um, powerfully display the heart of Pedro. Um, also, uh, biggest cheerleaders for the way we provide incredible value and outstanding experience for our customers and community. Um, I think it's really important to realize, um, you're going to be assisting with complaints and orders and errors. Like that you're going to get unhappy people are usually the people that come most to customer experience and you need to be okay with that and realizing it's okay. You're just there to assist them. You're just there to help them you're there to advocate for them. So I think that making sure people understand what they're up against, but this is the part that I wanted to really spend some time on this morning. And it's the three to five key things as you go to hire. Key responsibilities, onboarding new customers. Um, that's a big one. Making sure the on-ramp is good, you know, making sure their experience is great when they start. Um, so new customer support, uh, making sure the newest people are being addressed. People that have been around for a while, they might need not need as much loving, but the new folks, they do. Um, adding new customer data into the CRM platform, and then largely, not only these two things, but also responding to customer inquiries. Um, notice here, we only have two key responsibilities, and that's onboarding and responding to new customers. Some of, sometimes you have sub points underneath it that make it pretty robust. And so three, three to five might not be three to five, it might just be two because of how many details are locked into those two. Mm -hmm. So this one's responding to customer inquiries, talking about live chat. We keep our live chat open 12 hours a day. Um, so that takes some pretty significant staffing. Um, email management, you're going to need to make sure that um, you're monitoring uh, Zendesk tickets as they come in. Um, Facebook community, staying engaged there to make sure that you're watching for customer support issues that may surface there and needing to redirect folks to where we want to get them answers. Phone management, we try and we try and make that a small percentage. Like we don't want to keep people on phones. We would rather address them. You can do one to many better on tickets than you can on phones, but there is some occasional times where we'll resort to phone calls or Zoom meetings. They need to know that they need to be able to do that. And then affiliate management, just to assist in helping the affiliate manager triage duties. You don't want to escalate everything up to a role that really people that are at first line of defense can answer first line of defense questions so that you don't create a catch all in your affiliate manager. And then performance, key performance indicators, KPIs. Um, the better we serve our customers and provide outstanding support, the happier they are. We want to create raving fans in our customers, and this position can do exactly that. Response time, these are the key indicators. We want to make sure that you respond to fixed customer issues within 24 to 48 hours. Make sure that you um, are able to operate within your hours and you're working your shifts consistently, and then make sure that your refunds are low. We've, uh, we just got off a meeting last night, Ben and I, with their organization on, let's put a percentage at that. What, what's the percentage we're hoping to keep refunds at? You know, and then let's hold people to the fire on how can we all move towards that metric? The more that you can make your organization metric, the better, because then it's not, I have this gut feeling about this person. I have this gut feeling about the situation. Visionaries 
are so prone to going with their gut and it's great. It's what makes them great at business, but they need metrics to drive that because we all know sometimes our emotions are all over the place and our gut can mislead us if we're being given wrong metric. So I think it's really important to um, establish metrics. And then as you go down, you know, just key competencies, this is a lot of boilerplate stuff, physical demands and abilities, et cetera. Ben, Taryn, do you guys have anything that you want to add to that conversation? I don't. Um, I think it's a pretty good job description. It can vary by the job. Awesome. Yeah. When would you, uh, so I, my question is, uh, what would you, or when would you say is a good time um, to put um, a pay value on this or would you leave it off? You know, have you seen times where that works better or works worse? Um, we've gone both ways. We've had times where we would include pay here right underneath status. Um, sometimes that can keep people out of the job that you mm -hmm. might want to have a conversation with. Um, but sometimes it might keep people out of the job that you don't want to have a conversation with. You know, if, if you know this is a, a 15 to $20 an hour position and somebody's looking for 70 grand a year, like that's, that's not a realistic expectation. It's probably better to have that conversation early on than mm -hmm. to get them all the way through an inventory or, you know, an, an interview process to only realize, oh, we're going to miss. That's a huge miss, you know? So I think there's probably... Probably on, I would say lower level positions, I would probably include it. Um, upper level positions, I would probably leave it off so you can have some negotiation conversations around, like if I'm hiring a marketing manager, that, that could be a pretty broad sweeping, how much experience do they have? If they've been doing marketing for Pete Vargas for the last seven years, well, that person's gonna have a higher value than somebody who's like, well, I just got out of college, but I think I could really do this for you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a much different conversation. So, Good to know. 